continuing on from the parts that we had covered yesterday and the day before, we're going to wind up, hopefully we're going to wind up this series at the end of today, and we'll be moving on to something else. Andrew? Pardon? No, I'm afraid that that might make the rest of you a little hazy and drowsy, and, and it might put your head down on the desk and put you to sleep, and that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be fair to me. Do you know what the word Soviet means? Good. Well, that's, that's good. And all of you doing talking, would you like to come up here and do the lecture? Daniel, you want to do the lecture? These are Russian airliners, and as you can see, probably if you know anything about aviation and about Russian, about any other kind of airliners, generally they are copies of both American and British jetliners. That saved them a lot. They saved them billions of rubles to be able to not have to go through the design and development of aircraft. All they had to do was to steal all of the information from the Allies, from Russia. France, I mean, from the United States, France, and Britain, and to some extent, even down in South America. Everybody knows we've, we've gone ahead and we've covered the, the Concorde, but then here's the, the Soviet version of the Concorde. Now, it's amazing that they did the same thing, except they put canards on the front. Go back and look at that. No canards, this one. But they did, they dropped the nose. Strange, huh? It looks like it's hinged at exactly the same spot. It's exactly the same length from the hinge to the tip. It's exactly on the same side. What? Pardon? When you come in for a landing, you remember if you ever see a Boeing 747 coming in, it's pitched up like this, right? You have to pitch up to slow down. Because the angle, you have to start getting the angle of attack to the point where it's going to generate maximum lift, but not go critical and stall. So as you come in for a landing, you're pitching your nose higher and higher. Because of the shape of the wings, the delta wing, when you raise the nose of the, of the, of the supersonic aircraft with the delta wing, your nose is so far off the ground that you have a hard time looking to see the runway. So... They bent that nose out of the way so that the pilots could actually see the runway. It's more, it's more evident. Well, it's pretty evident there, but if we go back to the Concorde, you can see now with the nose being bent out of the way, the pilots are able to see the runway much, much more clearly. Without that, I doubt that they would have a, an easy time at all ever of trying to land that Concorde because... With that nose in the way, you can't absolutely cannot see anything. I mean, you're almost like you're flying blind. So anyway, that's the Soviet Tupolev, Tupolev, T-U-P-O-L-E-V, 144. This was a big day in the, in the history of aviation. I was a Piper dealer at the time in 1977, 78, 79, and 80. And in 1978, the big deal was that the airlines were deregulated. Let me tell you how incredible that was. In 1977, if you called up for a flight from Los Angeles to New York, it wouldn't make any difference what airline you were calling, what time you wanted to go, what day, what hour. Every fare was exactly the same fare for every airline. didn't make any difference. So you never had to worry about whether or not you had to make all the calls to try to find the cheapest fare. You just decided what airline you wanted to fly on, and depending on the kind of equipment they had, maybe you wanted to fly on, for example, American Airlines in those days was advertising their fan jet engines. They were quieter, faster, more fuel efficient. So you really you didn't have a fair choice. You had to pay whatever it was that the government said should be the fair from city to city. Then all of a sudden in 1978, it's just, it was so amazing to be 
in aviation at that time, at least in my life, because it was like the whole world blew up in aviation. Most of the people were saying, wow, that's great. Most of the, peop most of the other people were saying, gee, I don't know what's going to happen now. It's going to be chaos. But in fact, deregulating the airline industry proved to be a boon to not only smaller startup airlines, but also to innovators, people who had new ideas that they wanted to develop. People like PSA and, and uh, Southwest Airlines and Air California and all of the companies who were just waiting, waiting in the wings for deregulation because they had heard that it might happen. So the minute that happened, PSA had 727s already ordered and some of them were already delivered and they wound up getting in line to transport people from San Francisco to L.A. for $7.50. And they transported thousands of people. And business developed between those two cities. Investment firms would locate in either city. It didn't make any difference. You could, you could be closer to your, to your customers in manufacturing. One of the reasons I'm sure why a lot of the, the early high-tech companies located it up there was because some of the early ones were there and the other high-tech companies, new startups, wanted to be next to them, so they located up there as well. And it wasn't a matter of, of having to travel by car or by prop plane from, from Los Angeles to San Francisco. It was simply a matter of getting on a PSA jet that was waiting on the tarmac for you. All you had to do was park your car, walk through the terminal, out onto the, to the uh, tarmac, and board the aircraft. You didn't have a boarding pass. All you had was a boarding pass didn't matter what seat you could sit in, you could sit in whatever seat you wanted. And then that aircraft generally would take off within 20 minutes of you getting there, even if it wasn't filled. Again, because they wanted to set the tone for low-cost airlines. Then the air traffic controllers. I can tell you that nearly every pilot that I know cheered when Reagan fired all those controllers because by the time it got to the point where they decided they were going to go on strike. They were some of the most arrogant, snotty, I don't care kind of people you can ever imagine. We, the, the, as pilots, we were having a difficult time dealing with them because they would do everything in their power to either irritate us, aggravate us, delay us, or, or cancel whatever request we wanted to make. So they decided to go on strike. That was illegal because in order to be hired by the FAA, you had to sign an agreement that because you were giving government service, you would never strike. And they all willfully signed those documents in order to be hired by the FAA. That was the basis on which Reagan fired them all. And everyone cheered. Of course, we all worried what was going to happen to traffic at all the airports. And yes, indeed, it slowed down. But what they did was they got all the people, a few of them anyway, who didn't strike as well as the people who were in the military running the military control towers. They moved them in, and all the management people in the FAA that had any experience at all in that area of air traffic control, they were brought in to be air traffic controllers until the FAA could ramp up enough to be able to get back to some normal level. Well, it took several years for them to get back to a normal level. And one of the things that Reagan said was, he said, I'm firing you now unless you, you, you have, I think he said, you had like 24 or 48 hours to go back to work. If you don't go back to work, you will never work as a controller again because part of his action was that the FAA was never allowed to rehire any of the strikers. Even if after the strike, even if some of the strikers came back and said, you know, we'd like our old job back at the same pay and in the same working conditions as before, they couldn't do it. So, so many men and women lost their means of support. There are stories all over the place where air traffic controllers making eighty or $90,000 a year wind up dishwashing in a restaurant because they all of a sudden they were fired, and now what kind of work can they look for? Maybe they can go overseas somewhere. Maybe they can go to some foreign country. But, it, but having been trained as an air traffic controller, you get fired, and what's your alternative? You can't work in a library. You might be able to. You can't work as a doctor or a dentist or a, an attorney. Yes, sir, Sergio. Pardon?
So that was a, that was quite an event. The other thing is the, the growth of the express delivery. No, one at a time. Oh, you need to go? I thought you said 2 o'clock, no? Okay, go ahead. In, in just a moment, yes. Go ahead. I hope you get that taken care of. I wouldn't want to see you get too sick. So at the point of, I was sitting at my desk in the company that I first worked for after my MBA program, and I remember an advertisement by a little startup called FedEx, and they showed they showed a, a little fleet of four little tiny jets, the smallest jet like Learjets, and they showed a fleet of them, and they talked about sending your packages by jets, and I thought to myself, they're nuts. There's nobody in the world that's going to spend that kind of money to send a part or a package on a, on a, a jet knowing at the time how much the jets cost and how much fuel they burn. Nobody would ever do it. So the, the, the group of us who were in the transportation department kind of laughed and said, you know, there goes another startup. Well, as you know, FedEx is not just another startup. They're an extreme example of a successful business that started from zero. And what they did was they appealed to people like the uh, automotive companies or the aviation companies where a part was critical for either an assembly line. Let's say an assembly line machine breaks down and you only have one machine and it's got a part that's missing or it broke and you can't start up your entire production operation unless you have that one single part and you can't wait a week or two for it to go through the mail You've got to have it. And that's what put FedEx on the map. That's how they wound up making so much money because that little fleet of four little tiny uh, jets began to be 5, 6, 10, 20, 30. And then pretty soon they be began to realize that instead of having 30 little jets running around the country, they'd get bigger ones and bigger ones, and they built themselves up. And, of course, that's what FedEx is today. Not only are they an air airline company, they're also a ground delivery company. And... And uh, it's just an amazing story. Um, small commuter airlines emerged. I happened to have, in my, when I was in the Piper dealership, I happened to sell a Piper Chieftain to a company called Baja Cortez Airlines. They was a, a, a plain old startup. Some guy came in. He had a lot of money. He bought a couple of, of Chieftains from me, 330000 each, as I recall. Um, and he wanted to transport people from Los Angeles down to Mexico, Loretto, Loretto in Baja. And, uh, he, you know, he did it for a while. It didn't work out. He went out of business. But the fact is that was the kind of thing that was happening in the late 70s. People were innovating everywhere. They were starting commuter lines. Some commuter lines boomed and some didn't. Um, so it was just it, the late 1970s in aviation was just incredible, um, not only because of what you see on the, on the post here, but also because um, it turns out that, it was really the, the top level of aviation, and then from that point on, for a variety of reasons, it started downhill. So in the Cold War, we were still continuing along with the Cold War, and that was in the 70s. We were still dealing with the Cold War. And so we had several things that were going on. NORAD was very well known. It was operated by a group in a, underneath a mountain, Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, they burrowed out the bottom of the mountain and they put an entire control facility down there. They had offices and they had workspace and kitchens and everything you can think of. It was like a little city that was buried under the mountain. And from that mountain alone, they controlled all of the defense and the bombers that would roam around the world. They would control from that particular mountain. Just, it's hard to believe that, that people can just dig out so much rock just to put in f facilities that are impervious to atomic weapons. But in fact, that's what happened. So MAD was one of those things where that, that idea alone, MAD, mutually assured destruction, was one of the things that helped with Kennedy and Khrushchev when Khrushchev put missiles into Cuba. 
they both began to realize that if they let it go any further, there was going to be a war and that we would all obliterate one another. So the whole concept of mutually assured destruction was a concept that probably kept the world from going crazy and starting to blow one another up with, with uh, atomic weapons. ICBMs, that was something that that was there. That, uh, Of course, the, what was the first ICBM? Does anybody remember? The very first ballistic missile? Not the V-1, the V-2, but you're close. The V-2 was the first ballistic missile. Remember, the V-1 was just a little airplane. It had wings and it had a tail and it had a rocket engine on it. And it was just a little airplane with explosives in the fuselage. But the V-2 was the first real, honest-to-gosh, intercontinental ballistic missile. One of the things that kept the rest of the world at bay was the fact that not only did we have nuclear submarines, but we had Polaris missiles in those submarines. And I don't know how many, but I think it was something on the order of 12 to 20. And each one of the missiles, missiles carried an atomic bomb. So with all of the fleet of nuclear submarines, plus the kind of weaponry that they carried, and because nobody could track them around the world, there wasn't a country in the world, including Russia, that would even think about starting a war with the United States, even if they sent bombers over to destroy us with atomic weapons. Possibly they wouldn't even get her, because remember we had talked about the dew line, distant early warning up in Alaska and around the Bering Strait? Okay. Well, that, that should have picked up any poss possible bombers coming from Russia. But in any event, no matter what, if anybody tried to do anything to the United States, we had submarines all over the world, underwater, loaded with Polaris missiles. Talk about a scary concept if you're running a country like France, maybe, or, or uh, Japan, and you start getting pretty aggressive with the United States. You have to remember that the United States, can, in a moment, can obliterate your country. Okay, U.S. bombers, you know, we, we had a lot of development of bombers uh, over the years. I, I just kind of really love this one. It's called the Hustler, Convair B, B-58. Um, that pod in the center, I'm not sure what that pod's all about because most of the pictures that I've seen of the Hustler, and I saw the Hustler in person, didn't have that pod underneath the fuselage. It could have been some sort of multiple warheads in multiple rockets. I don't know. But I'm sure it had something to do with, with ordnance, O-R-D-N-A-N-C-E. Everybody know the difference between ordnance and ordnance? Okay, ordnance, O-R-D-N-A-N-C-E, is weaponry. Right. Ordnance, O-R-D-I-N-A-N-C-E, is a regulation. Like, it's like... So like uh, you can't park um, where a street where it's where it's got a red curb, or you have to come to a stop. There are ordinances, for example, in housing. You can't build a home without having a sufficient septic system. Those are ordinances. So ordinances are laws and regulations. Ordinance, without the I, is weaponry. General Dynamics FB-111. This was built in Fort Worth, Texas. And it was extremely controversial. I mean, the controversy on that thing went on probably for two to three years of who's going to get the contract and whether they're capable of doing it. And even after General Dynamics produced it, they were criticized all over the place for what they thought was the lack of, of, uh, of uh, in clever design. In this particular case, there's a swing wing. So the wings come out when they come into land. So with the swing wing, it does two things. Number one, it gives you more lift capability because in swinging out like that, the, the airflow goes over the wing more carefully. Secondly, um, it, gives you a, it gives you an opportunity to uh, come in much slower for landing than if you were flying what, is, what that looks like. It looks like a delta wing, doesn't it? When you have the wings brought back like that, it, it, it it's sort of a virtual delta wing like the Concorde or the Tupolev 144. So in this case, it's, it's a swing wing that operates at slow speed with, with the wings swung out into normal conventional positions. And then for extreme fighter and, and speed, they, they sweep back like that. 
and the Rockwell B-1B Lancer um, was another aircraft that was built mainly for supersonic speed as well as being able to carry large atomic weapons. By large atomic weapons, I, I'm talking about weapons that have the same explosive capability as what were dropped on Japan in World War II. By the time this bomber came out, though, the size of the bombs that were dropped, the bomb was called Little Boy and something else. I forget. Pardon? Yeah. And so the size of those bombs was huge, but in no time at all, the people in Los Alamos were able to figure out how to shrink that bomb size down and still get that and more explosive capability. So by the time the B-1B bomber was now flying nuclear weapons, they were carrying way more nuclear force than anything that was dropped on Japan in World War II. Now, this is the Nighthawk. I don't know how much this ever really came into use, but it's a flying wing. You don't see too many flying wings flying around these days, even though the concept is kind of interesting. Uh, it certainly reduces drag because the whole wing is now a lifting surface. But I, I rarely have ever seen anything about this or about its capability or about the fact that it's being built in large numbers. I don't think anything like that's happening. Then the Soviets came along. Obviously, at the same time, they're going to be trying to steal information from us. Now, it looks like they didn't do too much, too good a job stealing in that backfire, although that may be a version of the F-111. It looks like now there's a swing wing. But that was that blackjack bomber was designed to compete with the B-1B, our B-1B. Pardon? It was trying to compete with the B-1B Lancer, the one I just showed. Okay? That one. That's ours. All right? And then that's Russia's. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> private and general aviation, and we, had, we have discussed this before in various classes where general aviation began to develop substantially in the late 70s. Lots of things happened then. Radios were getting better. Engines were getting better. The aircraft were being built a little bit better. There weren't a lot of real major improvements in aircraft in the 70s. What was built in the late 60s and early 70s pretty much carried all the way through and is still being, being sold today or resold on the used market. The, there were, you, you had three options for radios in those days unless you, were in, unless you were buying a Cessna. If you were buying a Cessna, you almost didn't have a choice. You had to buy a Cessna radios, and they were traditionally terrible, awful, awful. People would buy a Cessna, and they would tear out the radios, throw them away, literally throw them away because nobody would buy them, and they would put in Narco, King, or Collins. Now, if anybody is aware of general aviation today, there's a, there's a show every year in July called the, the uh, Oshkosh General Aviation Show, and it's put on by the Experimental Aircraft Association. And the number of aircraft that land and take off there in one period of time are the largest number of aircraft in the world. The air traffic controllers who work that field in Oshkosh, called Whitman Airport in Oshkosh, I've flown in and out of there, by the way, uh, have volunteered for that service. They're not paid to be air traffic controllers, but because it's such a remarkable display of, of moving aircraft in and out. You, if you get anywhere near Oshkosh, you are not instructed to do anything other than if you see that blue aircraft to over to your right, you follow him. No matter what he does, you follow him. And then they bring you around a crazy path. And all you're doing is following the guy ahead of you. You're not given any instructions other than follow that blue and white aircraft ahead of you. And that's how they get thousands, literally thousands of aircraft on the ground at Oshkosh every year both on the ground and then in the air. And then, of course, they have air shows all week long. I think it's a, a week or ten day show. But if you ever are interested in general aviation of any sort and you can afford the time and money to go back to Wisconsin, I would suggest you go to that field, the Oshkosh Airport, in July. 
Okay, now we're going to pick up the last lecture in this series. Okay, so here we are, still in general aviation. We're continuing on with general aviation. And since I was in the business in the 70s and the early 80s, I can tell you from experience what was going on then. So if you have any more questions other than what I'm going to be talking about, feel free to ask me. But some of the ones that are still flying today are Glass Air, Lance Air. Uh, Rutan has a few little things he comes out with. The RV is maybe the most successful his name is Van Grunsden. Van Grunsden is the guy's name. It's Richard. I think it's Richard RV. Um, and I've flown in a number of series of the RV. I've flown RV3, RV4, and RV6, RV7, and RV10. Um, and they're almost always, they are home built. But the kits are so beautiful and so well done that you only require to build 51% of the airplane. The FAA allows the manufacturer, RV, to give you a kit that is 49% built. The wings are all built. The fuselage is mainly built. You just have to do a lot of building of the tail surfaces and the assembly and other things. But if you ever have a chance to fly in an RV, take it because they are just amazingly beautiful aircraft and they're extremely um, sensitive to the touch. You can roll an RV aircraft in so fast that People who have been given rides in an RV where it's a snap roll around, where you go from level all the way around to level again, and then they're asked, which way did we turn? They can't tell you for sure. That's how fast the airplane rolls, and that's what the mind can't keep up with, the fact that it rolled to the right or rolled to the left. Kristen is, is a company that used to produce something called the Kristen Eagle, and it's like the pits. The pits is a, a single seat and a du dual seat. They're short little biplanes like this one we have out here. Very similar to the one that's out here, that yellow one from the EAA. The one you guys have seen, that biplane. Are you familiar with you remember that? Okay, well, the pits and the Kristen Eagle are both very similar. If, you, if they were all painted the same and you saw them sitting on the ground together, you probably wouldn't be able to tell one another. I don't know anything about rotorway, so I'm not going to bother with that. Uh, the rotorway is a, is a, a helicopter. What? Well, fabric is cloth, right? But these days, if you're going to refabric an airplane, you're going to do it with, with something that's like nylon, very, very high tensile strength nylon. Still fabric, and you still have to go through the fabric process of covering an aircraft. But the material they use today is so far superior. In fact, you can actually get two kinds of material. One of the things we did wrong, for example, we stripped one of our gliders of the old fabric, and we put new fabric on what we thought was, well, let's do this. Let's get really high strength, even higher strength fabric than the standard that Schweitzer requires. So we did. Guess what? We lost 75 pounds of useful load as a result of using fabric that was heavier than the previous fabric. 75 pounds, that's a lot because now I used to be able to carry somebody that would weigh around 255 I can only carry somebody that weighs 205. So it's, um, it's a big mistake. Uh, I don't know what, what, how far down the road we're going to restrip that aircraft and, and put the standard fabric on again. But those are the kind of things you have to be really aware of when you're doing any kind of work with an aircraft. What are you talking about? The useful load? Are you changing the center of gravity? Those kind of things. Humberto. I don't know whether the, uh, the manufacturer would allow that. That's one of those things where you would have to get a written permission from somebody or you would have to get something like an STC um, where you actually get a signature from the FAA that says you are allowed to do that. Pardon? What? The Selma students, they're here, they need to go during the break, if you had the break already. Uh, we're going to have a break right now. What do you need now? You need to talk they, to somebody? No, they need to, we need to go. 
Who needs to go? Selma. And you need to go because of what? Um, the bus driver has other stops to make. But the driver's already had other stops. Why? Why? Are no, she has to leave. She has other stops after school, before school ends, because she does also middle school and elementary schools. Due to the driver having other stops, don't the drivers have other stops? Yes. Yeah, that's why they have to leave here. That's why they have to leave. That's why they have to Well, why do they have to leave now instead of at 3 o'clock? Normally, they don't get out till 3 o'clock. Yeah. She has to do elementary school since elementary school gets out at like 2.30, 2.23. And then we still got to go all the way back, and she has to go to the, high school, the middle school, but the elementary school. And that's just for today? That's just today. No, it's not the rest of the week. It's just today. Jesus. Who has to go? <laughs> all right, let's go. Everybody take a break. We'll be back here at 2.23. I'm, I don't quite, I don't quite understand what the what the requirement is for them. What's wrong with What's well, wrong with the driver? They can't They can't legally They can't legally They can't According to the school They can't get a ride back Like themselves Because we signed a paper Saying that we only take the bus here And the bus back I understand that it, it, So is this a bus Or is it a private vehicle? It's a school bus like, And it's the bus That always picks them up at three, After 3 o'clock But they have to be picked up today? Just, just today Not tomorrow Not just today Pardon? May I go to the cafeteria? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was um, trying to put the camera cover on my vehicle, on my drone, and I think that I might have heard you say be back at two. Yes, go ahead. At two, what time did you say? Two, did I hear it? Two thirty? Yeah, that's what I asked. What time? What? what time was I said two twenty-three. Oh, 223. That's why I heard it three Did you uh, give me any document, or are you going to give me a document? Huh? Uh, I'll get you on the night. Uh, but you're going to come back until you have to leave, right? Okay.